Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. My wonderful wife, Marcella, is that how you say it, Marcella? Why don't you guys stand up? Let's give them a good hand. It's great having them here. I don't know how many years it's been since I, you saw Jed, but it's been a long, long time. It's great to meet his wife. I haven't officially met her yet, but it's great to have you guys here. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And uh, so they're living in, in the Philippines, doing mission work there. And so make sure you say hi to them and greet them uh, as they, at the end of the service. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm talking to you, uh, a couple weeks ago I started this series, I titled this Soul Detox, Soul Detox. Now, the word detox is a word that, um, you know, it's pretty popular nowadays. It has to do with, you know, most of the time cleansing your body or uh, detoxing all the toxins out of your system. And uh, basically what they do is they change your eating habits for a short period of time. Sometimes they'll tell you to fast, drink this terrible stuff. And, uh, and, and what happens is your body actually gets cleansed. And, um, you know, some people say, well, it doesn't work. But other people claim it, it does work. Well, I kind of use that terminology, detox. And I want to talk to you about uh, soul detox. Uh, I think I told you this last time that man is made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians tells us that the God of peace sanctify you wholly. Pray God your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is true that most people have no idea how important the condition of their soul is. Most people have no idea how important it is. We never even think about the fact that we should examine our thoughts. We should examine our feelings. We just kind of let it go. It's like sometimes... You ever seen a, one of these little ladies? I don't know why little people a lot of times, I shouldn't say little people, but uh, smaller people a lot of times get big dogs. I don't know why that is. And, and sometimes they'll take them out for a walk and you see them. It's actually, looks like the dog is walking the person. You ever seen that ha where the dog's taken off? And that's kind of how our, our soul can be at times, where it's so out of control. It's, it kind of has a mind of its own. Uh, our feelings go all these different places. I don't know if you ever thought about this. You say to yourself, I shouldn't feel this way. How many ever had that happen? Or I shouldn't feel this way. Three people. The rest of you, you always feel right all the time about everything. I mean, I, sh I say that many times. I say, I shouldn't feel this way. And, um, and so sometimes these feelings and these thoughts can get so, uh, go, so planted inside of us that we, um, we have difficulty. Our soul is our big, becomes our biggest problem. We go to church. It's time to worship God. In our, and even though we got our, maybe we got our hands up or we're singing the song, our soul's not engaged. We're just kind of mouthing the words, but there's really no feeling. There's no focus. It's just basically meaningless chatter. I don't know if you ever thought that. And, uh, you know, David, if you read the book of Psalms, you see that over and over again, David had a battle or he had, I should say, he struggled with his own soul at times. At times he would talk about his soul, how his soul was following hard after God, like my soul pants after the water brook, uh, as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after you. That's how it goes. You, oh God. And so at times his soul was engaged, uh, but at other times he had trouble with his soul and he would talk to his soul. He'd say, soul, why are you downcast? Uh, soul, why are you disquieted within me? He would actually yell at his soul, come on, what's, what's up with you today? You know, it's like, we're, we're, you know, hope thou in God, put your focus on God. Great days are yet ahead. And he would, he would deal with his own soul. A lot of us don't realize that that is our responsibility, that we can't just let our mind go anywhere it wants to go. We can't just let our feelings go any direction it wants to go. I mean, the truth is that if you let your feelings go and you follow them without bringing them in line, your feelings will take you to hell. Good thought, Steve. Thank you. 
But it's absolutely true. You can't, even though our feelings affect us, we have to have enough sense to realize that our feelings are not always on track. Like sometimes I use this with my wife. I have a beautiful wife. She's an awesome woman of God. She's the greatest woman on planet Earth. And we're, we've been married over 40 years. I'm still chasing her, passionately chasing her. And, uh, but, but the thing about it is, there's times I look at my wife and I go, why did I marry you? And I know there are times she looks at me and wonders that. I mean, I have to admit that those times are fewer and far between, but that's how your feelings are. And what I learned, and I've said this to young couples over and over again, that if you stay engaged and stay at it, what happens, your feelings always come back. And I look at my feelings and go, where were you? You know, it's like, you know, you were, <laughs> you were on a sabbatical or something, and now it came back, and they always come back stronger, and they always come back more defined and more uh, refined. And so that's why feelings go up and down, but I think, I look at it like this, it's up and down, but it's up and down, upward progress if you stay committed. How many know what I mean? And then when they do come back, sometimes they come back so strong, you go, I, I worship the ground you walk, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, but that's how your soul is. And so we have to tend to our own soul. We can't let our soul become divided. It's up to us. It's interesting that the Bible calls Jesus the shepherd and bishop of our souls. And uh, one of the things it says in the book of Hebrews, we won't look at it today, but it talks about how leaders in the church are supposed to oversee people's souls. Because they know that if your soul gets in trouble, you're going to be in trouble. In other words, if like attitudes begin to get in there, like unforgiveness or bitterness take root in your soul, if that happens in your soul, it's going to begin to draw you away. And it's almost like a hook in your soul. It begins to draw you away from the presence of God and the things of God. And so we got to go like, let's get that hook out of your soul and get you back on track. And so that's why it's so crucial. Because here's another thing that I, I discovered about this, is that there are opportunities that God makes available to every single one of us. There are opportunities. It's almost, I said this two weeks ago, it's almost like an invisible door opens up and it's an opportunity that God presents for your future. And we see this in the life of David. And at that crucial moment, what you do, decisions that you make, the path that you take at that critical moment will determine whether you go through that door or you turn and walk away and miss that opportunity. Now, the opportunity may come again. Thank God for that. But sometimes people keep missing opportunities and they live their whole life and they're in, they live in regret because they never walk through an open door that was set for them into their future. And that's why you say, well, I, want, I don't want to miss the open door. Well, here's the thing you got to do is you got to learn to shepherd your own soul. You have to learn to keep yourself on track. You know, some people say, how many know this is true sometimes that people can, what they do can trip us up. Have you, have you ever had that happen where somebody did this to you? Maybe borrowed money, didn't pay you back or said something hurtful to you or, or this or, or, or did something hurtful to somebody. And so what happens is resentment or bitterness can rise up in your soul. Listen, that's a trap. And if you let that take root, because you cannot live in this life without bad things happening. I know that's a shock to some of you, but you cannot. You are not a cupcake. You are not a marshmallow. I mean, I don't know if you watch some of the news, but now they have situations where they actually, if, if a speaker comes to some of these universities and, the per, and people don't like what the speaker is saying, they have, room, they have rooms, they have hugging rooms. I'm not making this up. This is actually true. I sh it sounds like something a person would make up, but they have hugging rooms. That means because this guy says something I don't agree with, and you get so ups I'm so upset about that, I can go into a hugging room and be hugged. I is that ridiculous or what? I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? You need a hug. I mean, people do need a hug, but I mean, it's just because somebody says something that you disagree with, you, you got to go to a hugging room and be hugged. I mean, that is a little bit ridiculous, don't you think? And so what, what happens is you've got to learn to, to, to police or you got to learn to govern or guard or protect or weed your own soul. You have to be, you have to do it. Because I mean, no, I, can, I can watch you. And I can see sometimes that you have actions that are very 
disturbing to me because of some things you do. But really, the problem is, is what's going on inside of you. I don't know if you remember this formula that I gave you two weeks ago. Remember this? It's, it's everything starts with a thought. Remember that? Say yes. Everything starts with what? It's a test. It's an open book test. Everything starts with a thought. That's why when somebody does something that's really bad, you know, bad behavior, you don't go, what were, why did you do that? What you should say is, what were you thinking? Right? Because it wasn't, the, 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 the action wasn't where it started. It always starts with a thought. The next thing that happens is, it goes from a thought, it goes to a speech. Uh, in other words, it's what you talk, tell yourself. And we all talk to ourselves. We talk to ourselves more than we talk to anybody else. We may not come out of our mouth, but we, we, bat, we banter back and forth in our head. I can't believe she said that to me. How I'm not being respected around here. I can't believe. I mean, she'll give the kids a back rub for 30 minutes and I ask for a back rub. I get a 60 second back rub. I mean, what is going on around here? I ban you banter back and forth. I mean, you sometimes will, well, like my wife, she might do this. She'll go, I'm going to tell him this. If he says that, I'm going to say this. If she says that, I'm going to say this. If he says that, I'm going to slap him. I mean, that's kind of how we do. We just kind of go into that routine. We talk to ourselves. How many of that's true? I'm not, I'm not living on the moon. I know you guys, you guys talk to yourself. You guys rehearse things. We rehearse. A lot of times we rehearse hurts. We rehearse hurtful words. I can't believe that. What they did to me. I can't believe that. We rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it. And what happens is if you continue in that place, your soul becomes toxic. Now, sometimes it takes a lot to get over things. I mean, I'm not just saying, well, just forget about it. Sometimes it's hard to forget about stuff. How I many of that's true? Sometimes you've got to work through stuff. Sometimes you've got to ha ha talk to somebody. Help me get past this. Sometimes you've got to go confront the issue. Sometimes you've got to act proactively. You've got to do something kind for the other person. I remember years ago, there was this guy, and he was well, from around here. I'll be real vague, but he's not really around here anymore. But he used to just malign me. I don't know why. I'm just a nice guy. I can't believe why he malign me. But he, and he was a Christian. He was in the ministry and he, but he would, he had a, a ministry where he would take short term mission trips and then he would try to get some of our people to go. And then they told me, they came back. He said, the whole time the guy just maligned you. And so I'm like, Rrr. I mean, I'm just like, Rrr. I'm not having, my soul is not in good shape. I'm like, want to go over there, kick the door open and say, listen, and I'm just like, and so I'm bantering this back and forth. I'm talking to myself, bantering this back and forth. I'll tell you what, if he says this, I'll say that. If he says this, I'll call the fire of God down and destroy all of his flaky whatever he has. I, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And so I said, I think I should pray about this. So I started praying about this and I got real quiet and God spoke to me. You know what he said? Go over there and read him. No, he said this. I want you to send him an offering. Not out of the church, but on me personally. And at the time, it was a big offering. I mean, he said, I want you to send them $1,500. And I about fell over. $1,500. I'd like to send him something, but not that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so what I did was I wrote, I wrote a check, $1,500. Boy, was he ever nice to me the next time I saw him? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good. How you doing? <laughs> a lot better now, you know. But what I'm trying to say is that you have to, sometimes you have to, you have to do something offensive, not offen, uh, offensive, offen, not offensive, but off, on the offense. You got to put some action. You got to attack the thing. Do something kind. Build, make the person a cake. Make the person a pie. And go over there and say, hey, I heard you've been talking about me. I just wanted us to get down and just talk about it together. Me and you. Here's a cake or a pie. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But anyway, so. So it starts with thoughts, and then it's self-talk. And if, if your thoughts are in the wrong direction, and your self-talk is in the wrong direction, how many can see that you're becoming pretty toxic? How many can see that? You're, you're becoming pretty toxic. And so what will happen is that you'll make a decision. Your decision is number three. It's based on thoughts and self-talk. That's why you, if you said to somebody, why did you decide that? Well, they didn't you don't make decisions in a vacuum. 
How many know that's true? You make decisions based on this progression. It can happen pretty fast, but uh, then you make a decision and then you make an action. Action is number four. You, you, you do something. If you do something long enough, it becomes a habit. And so if you become habits, really form your future. So if you do something over and over again, it's a habit which creates your character and ultimately determines your destiny. And so you have to, in some way, if you want a different, if you say, my character stinks, can't tell the truth, can't, I steal, I don't do the right thing. If you want to change the process, you don't go, I'm going to stop this habit. Have you ever, how many of you ever tried to stop a habit? It's quite a bit of... There's quite a bit of force behind a habit. How many know that's true? It's pretty strong. I mean, there's, there's a lot of mm to a habit. Well, the, the, it didn't start with a mm. It started way back here. You got to change the way that you think. How many can see what I'm saying? And so you have somehow you have to interrupt the cycle. Because basically, if you are ending up in the wrong place, it's a cycle of death that you've, cre you've created. Now, you may justify it. I just talked to somebody recently, and they did something that was crazy. And I talked to them about it. I said, well, well, why did you, I shouldn't have said this, but why did you do that? And they began to tell me how they self, their self-talk. They said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, this person did this to me, and this person did that to me. And so they were justifying what they did based on this situation, that situation, this circumstances, instead of just owning up and say, I was thinking bad, I was talking bad, I was making bad decisions, and I was acting bad. How many follow me? You got to take ownership of it. It's not somebody else's fault. Because I, I said this, I think it was two weeks ago, that the quality of your life, now think about that. Ask yourself the question, what is the quality of my life? The quality of my life, the quality of my relationships, my mental and emotional well-being, my advancement and promotion in the kingdom of God is all determined on the condition of my soul. If my soul is messed up, it doesn't matter if I'm married to almost the someone who's nicer than God himself. If my soul's messed up, I'm, I'm walking around complaining. How many know that's true? If my soul's messed up, it doesn't matter. I could, be, I could be the pastor of the nicest church in the world. If my soul's messed up, I'm sitting at home going, why, Lord, why? Because my, but my, it's my soul's messed up. It's not based on my quality of life. It's not based on my circumstances. It's not based on the people in my life. If my wife was this way, or if my kids were this way, or if I had more money, or if I had better possessions, or if I didn't live in this nice house on a hill that overlooks a pond, if I didn't live there, if I lived somewhere else, then my life would be different. If somebody, this person treated me better, well, they probably should treat you better. Or if this person would change, they probably should change. How many know that's true? We should all change, but that's not What's going to determine the quality of your life? Because even if that person changes, you might go, oh, that's great for a while. And then you, you're going to go, you'll get up one morning and go, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> right? Because that's how the human nature is. If you don't get a hold of it, human nature is such that we're, we, we kind of despise what we have. And we're always thinking that if this was different, if that was different, instead of having contentment in our own soul. I mean, when you tell people in foreign countries, you know, a few years ago, I, one year, 2005, I went on six mission trips to foreign countries, mostly third world countries. And boy, I tell you, I was just like, man, we, us Americans, we need to be a little bit more grateful. That's what I kept thinking to myself. Every time I came back, I'm going, man, when you tell foreigners, we have two cars. Actually, more than that, a lot of us have more than two cars. Not, th not that they're all new, but we have, maybe have several cars. Uh, we have a whole closet. I mean, one of the biggest things now when you sell a house, you got to have big closets. They'll walk in and say, this is too small a closet. Why? Because I got all kinds of junk. <laughs> and I got to store all my junk in all my closets. I, I don't just dress for the season. I dress for the mood. If I, I'm dressed for the mood I'm in. Do you guys do that? I just wore my Harley shirt today because I was in the mood. 
But that's how we are. We got so much stuff. You tell foreigners in third world countries what we got. They're like, what? We not only have two cars, we have houses for our cars. Called garages. Some of the garages are heated. Speak to me. Some of them are heated. I mean, I know people that have a dog for Pete's sakes and their dog has an air conditioning in the house. Right? I remember one time I was in Sri Lanka and we were there and, and it was at, it, toward the evening and I looked out at this parking lot and it was like several stories and there was all these men there. And so I said to the interpreter, what's up with this? Why is, why is all these men there? They go, they live, in the, they live in the hill country and they come like for three to four or five months at a time and they work and they sleep there in the, in the gr- garage. And that, uh, the ramp they have for the hotel, they sleep there because they work construction. And it's too much money to rent a room, so they just sleep out in the open. And they cook out there and they do whatever they can just to survive and they try to collect all their money so they can bring it back to their families. I asked them, what do, what do they make? They make like $250, $300 a month. That's what they make. That's everything they make. They consider that good pay. All I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to shame us as Americans. All I'm trying to say is, hey, should we be a little bit more grateful? Should we just a little teeny bit more grateful for what we have? I think we should be a little bit more grateful. And so the quality of our life, it's not based on our circumstances. It's not based on the people in our lives or how much money we have or even how popular we are. The quality of our life is based on the condition of our soul. And so there's certain things here that I want to just talk about real briefly. Is there certain kinds of soul uh, the Bible talks about, and then there's the results or the, the, the inability, the issues that they create. The first one is a divided soul. Divided soul is found in James chapter 1, in verse 8. It's, it uses the term in the uh, King James, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A double-minded man. How many have read that verse? Well, if you read the verses before that, he's talking about praying. He said, if you lack wisdom, you're supposed to pray, ask God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering or doubting. He that wavers or doubts is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. Then it says this, being a double-minded man unstable in all of his ways. And so here's what he says. He said, if your soul is divided, how many ever heard the expression, I'm all in? I'm all in. In other words, I don't, nothing's back. I'm all in. In other words, I haven't got one foot in one arena and another foot in another arena. Being divided. I'm all in. If God tells me to do something, God shows me something in his word, I'm doing it. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what, it, what, what it, I have to go through, but I'm going to do it no matter what. That means you're all in. Your soul is, is undivided. You know, we, have you ever, ever worked with somebody? I remember one time we, we were doing this project and uh, I was with a bunch of guys and I said, well, let's do, that, let's do it this way. None of them thought we should do it that way. Of course, they all had a different way they wanted. We had like four different ways we want to do it. So I go, no, let's do it this way. And I think I was paying them so they had to do it my way. But I was watching them as we were working. They're all kind of like, you know, you know, they're picking up stuff and they're bringing it, you know, but you can tell they're like, this is not working out. I mean, have ever have seen that happen? This is not working out good. And what was happening was they were doing it, but their soul was divided. They weren't all in. They weren't like picking up stuff, you know, and and vigorously doing this. They were kind of like, it's like when you tell your kids to do something, they're kind of like, you know, they don't want to. And you're (laughs) you're threatening them. You will be on restriction for a year. You know, you won't even see a cell phone for, you know, however long. And they're like, oh, okay, you know, they're, they're going like this, you know, but they're not all in. And people live their Christian life that way. They're kind of like, well, I'm here now, but, but their soul is divided. James said that that one, that's, uh, that their soul is divided, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's scary, isn't it? If your soul is divided, he says you won't receive anything from the Lord. So what, what is the answer to, a, double, to a, a, a divided soul? In James chapter 1, he says, 
receive with meekness. Or first he says this, look at verse 21. Therefore lay aside filthiness and overflow of wickedness. So filthiness and overflow of wickedness, that's like, if you look at it in gardening terms, that's like weeds. If you don't deal with the weeds, any farmer will tell you, if you don't deal with the weeds, it cuts down on the, the, the harvest. You'll cut back on the harvest. You go out there and your little soybeans will just be little BBs, you know. <laughs> right? Your, your, your uh, corn cobs will be like bonsai corn, just little, like this big. Like, oh, look at that little midget corn cob, you know. <laughs> Why? You didn't deal with the weeds. You didn't deal with things that were sucking the nutrients out of your soul. He says, first of all, lay that aside. How many know that, that, that stuff comes to us in all different ways? Like if, if you're on the internet, some of you guys are on the internet, and you have temptations. You know what the Bible says you should do? This is the modern version now. Take your, take your computer and throw it out the window. I thought that would go over big. <laughs> See, Jesus said, if your hand offends you, what? See, you all know that verse, don't you? Yeah, cut it out. You know, whack. <laughs> you know, if, if we literally did that, you know what church, song service would be like? <laughs> Clap your stumps, all you people. <laughs> right? I mean, come on, you, you know that. But what he's trying to say is not cut your hand off, but he's trying to say is whatever it is that is causing you to stumble, you have to become so violent about it, you got to get rid of it. Amen. If it's a person, don't, not your spouse, by the way, but if it's a person, you got to say, no, no, thank you. My soul is more important than my friendship with you. Whatever it is, if it's causing you to stumble, if it's, a, it's a something that causing weeds into your life, you got to get rid of it. Yeah. So he says, first of all, before you receive the word implanted, first of all, remove the weeds. Get rid of the weeds. Whatever it is that's giving weeds into your life. That means you have to, like I said, you have to interrupt the process. You know, they say the definition of insanity is do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. How many of you do the same thing? If you don't like the results, maybe you like the results you have right now. But if you don't like the results you have right now, if you don't interrupt the process, guess what? From one year from today, you'll still be getting the same results. It's because you have, I'm just waiting for God to do something. God's waiting for you to do something. You have to interrupt the process. You got to say, uh-uh. If, you, if you're not strong enough, then find somebody you can ask Help me interrupt the process. Would you please be the white towel ministry, the wet towel ministry in my life? You know what the wet towel ministry is, don't you? You get swapped, swatted with a wet towel. You know, It hurts, right? Amen. That went over good. All right. So, but you have to interrupt the process. So he said, remove the weeds. And then he said, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is what? Able to save your souls. It's able. Notice the word souls there. It's able to save your soul. What happens is the word. He didn't just say receive the word. He said receive the word implanted. That means it's got to find ground. It's got to find root in you. Listen to this. This is. You may look at this as bad. But let me just say it like this. There is hope for your situation. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. There is hope for your situation. It doesn't matter if it's a. If it, it doesn't matter if it's a physical problem. It doesn't matter if it's a, a life problem. If it's a destination problem. There is hope for your situation. You are not hopeless. And you are not in a hopeless situation. But if you don't interrupt the process, it's going to continue on the same course. See, God puts it in your hands. You have the ability to interrupt the process. And so the first thing one is the divided soul. The second one here. I call it a wandering soul, but it's basically someone whose heart is not responding to God. In Ephesians chapter 4, let's look at that real quickly here. Paul says, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. The word futility basically means the emptiness or the purposeless of their minds. In other words, they don't see anything else in this life but just to, you know, get stuff, 
And like we say sometimes, get all you can, can all you get, and then what? Sit on the can and then die and then somebody else will sit on your can, right? I mean, that's basically how people live their life. There, there's nothing more eternally valuable about their life than just things and stuff. And, and that's all they got. And so because their thoughts, here's what Paul says, they walk in the futility of their minds because their thoughts are, are faulty or purposeless. Their actions follow. So in other words, Gentiles live terrible lives because they think terrible thoughts. Now some of them aren't horrible lives, but sometimes they live horrible lives because their thoughts are terrible. Here's another thing. Christians live terrible lives. Why? Because their thoughts are terrible. And so that's why he's saying, you Christians don't live like they do and they live that way because their thoughts are empty or purposeless. So in other words, have some other type of thoughts that invade your thinking. And so every single one of us, we have to change. It starts with the way we think. That's why it's so important for us. You know, uh, the, the next soul here I got down is, uh, it's talking about, is a noisy soul. How many know there's a lot, so many things that distract us nowadays? I mean, I mean, I can't even think of all the things because I'm not tech. I'm not tech savvy, but we have Facebook. I know about that. I'm not on there, but I know about it. You know, I was talking to somebody one time. He came to church here, and I go, "Oh yeah, well, you know, we got two kids married, and another kid's going to get married. That was before Jeremy got married to lovely Katie here." But uh, so, so I said, "We got two kids married. They got some kids and." Grandkids, I got some grandkids. So I'm telling them all about this. And she looks at me. She goes, I already know all that. I haven't seen her like in years. I go, how do you know that? Oh, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. They know everything. How many less? I don't know anything, but they know everything. They know everything about everything. <laughs> they got Facebook. They got Twitter. How, how many of you ever heard of <laughs> What did I say that wrong? Twitter? <laughs> Twitter. They got <laughs> Periscope. How many of you ever heard of Periscope? Some of you older people know about that. Oh, I should hang out with you guys. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what it is. It sounds, it sounds like creepy. It sounds like a stalker, doesn't it? Periscope. <laughs> and now here's one that's of the devil. Pinterest. <laughs> and nobody can make their food taste like they say the food tastes like on Pinterest. Have you ever tried to do something they tell you to do on Pinterest? It just never works out that way. You're supposed to be this beautiful circle. When you get done with it, some oblong looking freak thing that you made up. But they got all these things. And so we have access to so much information and so much stuff. And what it creates is a noisy soul. Our souls are so noisy. You, you want to hear something really funny? I don't have ADD. But the other day, I went out, I go, I got, the lawn was long. I go, I got to go mow the lawn. So I go outside to mow the lawn. Then I looked over, and I saw my wife had raked up. Do you guys have a lot of acorns this year? I got to hurry up. Acorns, she rakes up, they're like ball bearings. They're everywhere. <laughs> and so she raked up two piles of acorns. I look over, I go, oh, no, she put them right in the yard. So then I go out to get a shovel and a rake to rake up the acorns. And on the way to get there's something else, something else uh, I saw that needed to be done. So I did that. And then I was coming back with this. So now I'm like an hour into this situation. And then I, I, I'm grabbing the shovel and the rake. And I look over and I see a, a, a plant growing out of my gutter. And I go, oh, no. So then I go get, a, go get the ladder. And when I get into the, where the ladder is, there's something else there. And I start doing that. And my wife's going, what's going on out there? Now you're going to mow the lawn. It's not that I'm not doing anything. It's just that I am distracted. I did. I went out to mow the lawn. I did. I counted nine things before I got the lawn mowed. <laughs> Took me hours. I was up there doing the rain gutters. But anyway, so, so that's a noisy soul. Have you ever sat down to pray and read your Bible? And what happens? Did you, did you shut this off? Did you do this? Did you do that? 
And so then you get up, oh, I got to do that. Then you go, I got to do that. Oh, I got to do that. Oh, I got to do that. I got to do that. It's like, remember the definition of distraction. It's like you're being pulled apart because of all these things. That's why David said in the Psalms, he said, he said, I have quieted my soul. My soul is like a weaned child within me. He quieted his soul. You cannot hear the voice of God if you don't quiet your soul. You got to quiet your soul. Get it, get it quiet. You get it quiet through meditation. You get it quiet through. That's why Jesus said, go into your closet. Shut the door. That's why big closets are really important. <laughs> That's the second reason big closets are really important. Because you're, <laughs> you're supposed to spend a lot of time in there. Do you ever hear that story about, uh, do you guys want to, I got to quit, but. Did you ever hear the story about the kid that was being punished? He, he, parents put him in the closet. He was screaming, hollering in there. And I know he did that nowadays. He'd be in prison. But back then we did it. And so he's in there screaming, hollering. Finally, he got quiet. And so after a while, the mother goes and opens the door. She says, what are you doing? He goes, <laughs> he goes I've been spitting on your clothes. <laughs> And I spit, and I spit, and I spit, and now I'm waiting for more spit to come. <laughs> right? So maybe you should put them in his closet. <laughs> the third type of soul is a religious soul. Religious souls put forth effort, but it's always in the wrong direction. You know, it's interesting when the book of Hebrews was written, it's written to Hebrew Christians. These were not like Gentiles, but they were Hebrew Christians. And he says, he makes a statement. He says, the first elementary principle of the doctrine of Christ is repentance from dead works. See, he didn't say repentance from sin, even though sin is a dead work. But he doesn't say repentance from sin. He says repentance from dead works. It, it includes sin, but it also includes works that we do with the wrong motive. In other words, works that we do to try to become acceptable with God and not looking at Jesus. Jesus died to make us acceptable with God. So when we try to do things to gain God's favor or to gain God's approval or to earn God's love, when we try to do things to earn God's love, it's the wrong, it's a dead work. See, we do good things because we have God's approval. At the River Jordan, Jesus heard God say from heaven, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. He started his ministry with the approval and the love of God. We need to start our Christian life with the approval and the love of God. Everything that we do is because we are loved and because we are approved. Not to get loved or get approved. Does that make sense? So a dead work is a work that we do. Uh, it's, a, it's directed in the wrong, the wrong place. Amen. I got a lot more to say about that, but let me give you this last one. As the worship team comes, let me give you this last one, and that is a captive soul. That, that, a captive soul is a soul that's in bondage. And usually what happens a lot of times is when you're in bondage, you justify your sin by some lie that you believed. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, it says, tribulation and anguish... Let's think about those two words. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first and also the Greek. That's Romans 2 verse 9. Notice what happens is when we give our lives over to the wrong thing, we open our life up to the wrong stuff. And he says that we end up with tribulation and anguish of soul. So here's, let me say this to you. How many would like to have, like, well, I, I'm not going to ask that. I'll say it like this. We all want different circumstances, better circumstances. We want better relationships. We want our life to be better. And the God, God promises that. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But here's what you have to understand. Is that what God is focused on is not your circumstances. What God is focused on is your heart. And if you want to break through outwardly, if you want to break through outwardly in your circumstances, your breakthrough outwardly is tied to what happens inwardly. 
In other words, first it happens in you before it happens through you. And the level, listen to this, the level of your inward breakthrough determines the level of your outward breakthrough. So when you stand around going, God, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Have you ever thought that way? Come on, God, what's up with you? We're, look at all this stuff. We're looking at the outward. And God's going, I'm looking at the inward. When it breaks through inside you, you can expect it to break through outside you. When you gain the victory inside you, when you recapture your heart, when you recapture your soul, when you recover your soul from trouble, when you recover, you can expect something to happen outside. See, it says in John, he says, Beloved, I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Those are outward things. Prosper and be in health. Those are outward things. Even as your soul prospers. That's inward things. We stand around going, I don't know why God doesn't do something. I mean, what's up with you, God? And God's going, how about you prospering inside? How about you capturing your soul? How about you getting rid of the stuff inside you and starting making a shift and breaking the cycle of death? How about you doing something? How many can see what I'm saying? Let's all stand together. I heard a guy say this. He said, my success in watching over my heart determines the level of breakthrough I'll experience in my life. My success in watching over my heart my thoughts, feelings, determines the level of breakthrough I'll experience in my life. See, I have to watch my thoughts. Someone goes, yeah, but I, I need to, th I don't know if you ever thought about it, because this is what I think about. I think if I don't think about this thing constantly, I'm not helping it or something like that. You think that way. You go, I got to worry about this continually. If I don't worry about this constantly, what? You, know, you, you want to say, what's going to happen? You know, nothing. You know, you're just going to make yourself sick. That's all you're going to get. You feel the need to focus on this because if I don't focus on it, something bad's going to happen or something. Hey, you're not an atheist. Right? Sometimes you have to put things in God's hands. You say, I can't change this. I've tried and failed and driving myself crazy, worrying about it. It's definitely not helping. I'm going to put this in God's hand. I, I tell that to the Lord sometimes. I say, Lord, I can't figure this out. Now, I don't know if you believe this or not, but I have blue Mondays. Because I analyze the service. I analyze it. You know, I, I go through every detail. I shouldn't have said that. My wife will tell me sometimes, don't use that joke ever again. <laughs> don't say that word. And, and so I analyze it. And sometimes, you know, the analyzation isn't very good. I mean, I, I come to a wrong conclusion. <laughs> this is the honest to God truth. I'm being real transparent now. Sometimes I've sat there in the chair looking at the wall going, I need to find a different, <laughs> I need to find a different line of work. <laughs> Are you surprised that I have that thought? I have that thought once in a while. These people deserve better. That's what I think to myself sometimes. And, and the point I'm trying to make is, if I let myself go, just like if you let yourself go, if I let myself go down that path, I could, I could make some very, very dumb decisions. And so I got to go, well, praise God, I'm going to trust God for what I can't control. And what I can control, here's what I can control this. I can control that. Sometimes I, I, I mean, this is kind of funny, but I get under a lot of pressure. When we had a lot of kids, I'd go out into the woods <laughs> and I built me a little lean to and I'd start a fire. I know it sounds funny. I know that like I mean, I don't know if the Native American spirit came back on me or something. I'd go out there, sit by the little fire and it's cold outside. I even did it in the wintertime. I sat out there and I would just pour out my heart. God, 
you got to help me. And I just tell him everything. And then I would begin to declare his promises over my life. Declare his promises. When I came out there, out from the woods, I was cold. My butt was wet. I smelled like smoke. But boy, did I feel good inside. Wow, it's amazing. God is the greatest encourager in the whole world. You talk about encouragement. You feel like you can run up that tree without even climbing. That, I mean, you just feel like, wow. You feel like if a big buck came, you could rip it in half. You know what I mean, just like, wow. You just feel like when you spend time with God. It's amazing. You have to, listen, listen to me. You have to get through this. You have to get through this because there's great days ahead. You've got to get through this because there's great days ahead. There'll still be tests ahead, but there are great days ahead. It's awesome things God has prepared for us. Let's sing this song.
God. God's good, amen? Well, let's lift our hand one more time and just thank God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. Your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah, that your mercy, Lord, is over all of our lives. Thank you, God. Your mercies are new every morning, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. We bless you, God. We bless you in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Well, God's good, isn't he? God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. We're going to give you the opportunity to be prayed for. And so if I have the prayer counselors, please come forward. If you are here this morning and you felt like during our message this morning that maybe something, you know, pricked inside of you or something was presented to you or something that you need prayer for, or maybe the message had nothing to do with your situation whatsoever, but you still need prayer. We want you to be prayed for before you go this morning. We have some nice, sweet prayer counselors up here that would love to pray for you and uh, give you the opportunity to be prayed for. And so if you are here uh, and would like prayer, we just invite you to, to join us. Also, after the service here, as soon as I dismiss, we have some refreshments in the back and we want you to come and join us. There's some coffee, some ding-dongs, Twinkies, Ho-Hos, and uh, they're awesome chocolate, cream-filled cupcakes. Awesome stuff, man. I'm kidding you not. And so please join us. Have some fellowship. But if you do need prayer, please come forward. Lord, I thank you for your people today. Pray your blessing upon them. Give them the greatest week they've ever had on planet Earth. And we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the fact that we get to be your people and spend eternity with you. We are grateful for that now. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you all. You're free to go. If you need prayer, please come forward.